1 Corinthians 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. Now this is the cross in the Red Sea. Now this is the baptism. Now when we see pictures of that Red Sea opening up, yes, there was a wall to the left and a wall to the right, but the cloud overshadowed them. What's a cloud? A cloud is, is moisture, wetness. They went through the water. The only part that there was not water was where their feet were. So what he's going to do is he's taking us back to the Red Sea in the book of Exodus. We're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That cloud that, that followed them by day and the fire that went by night, that cloud, they went in through that cloud. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, that's manna. And did all drink the, the same spiritual drink. They drank of that spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Now, isn't that interesting? That rock that Moses smoked and the water came out. Paul tells us that that rock followed them. Now, can you just imagine you're going through on your way to the promised land. You look off the left and here's this rock and rolling. I don't think it has legs. You know, Satan will steal from God what is true. And maybe that rock and rolling wasn't to be in the backseat of a car. Maybe it was God, Jesus Christ, following them to give them water. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? And then again, if not, you can take that and throw it in the garbage can. But I do know one thing. That rock that Moses smoked twice when he wasn't supposed to, that was Jesus Christ. Why didn't he get into the promised man? Because you ain't going to smite Christ a second time. He was smitten once for our sins. And then sat down the right hand of the Father. The next time you come to Christ for your sins, Jesus has sinned. You've already paid the penalty. You've already been nailed to that cross. I just got to ask you to forgive me and put it through the blood. You don't kill Christ again. But with many of them, the Jews, God was not well pleased. You mean this great assembly, the church of Moses, God was not happy with them all? For they were, over, for they were overthrown, follow my notes here, in the wilderness. They fell as they were going. God killed some of them. Now, these things were our example. Oh, so you read the Old Testament to learn things for your Christian walk, for your conduct, and what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. You're supposed to read all 66 books, not just your Psalms. It's ridiculous. God has given us all to read and to know. And then... Those sins that we commit that are in the Bible, we know they're sins and we need to confess them and get them right with God. Now these things were written in our examples to the intent, the reason, the reason we Christians should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now, Kind of interesting because when they were in that wilderness, what did they love? We have no water. We have no food. We have no water. We have no food. We have no water. We have no food. That's what they were griping and complaining about. Oh, look at that land. Oh, they got people who are like giants. We're just like grasshoppers. We're not going to get the victory. Aaron, we don't know what happened to him. Will you make us a god? And again, what we've been finding throughout the first Corinthians already is the food and eating, the belly. Is God not able to supply your needs? You think, well, what's wrong? They were thirsty and all that. Why didn't they just ask God? Instead of gripe and complain and blame Moses. 
lust after evil things as they also lusted. So lust is a sin. Lust can be found from the time of the Red Sea into the Promised Land. You can see lust. And you can learn what lust is. And it displeased God. And lust is just not looking at dirty, filthy pictures of men or women. You got to broad that definition more out. Lust is seeking the temptation to desire your flesh. And that can be with food, that can be with drink, that can be with entertainment. And God is not well pleased. Now, next, that's lust. Neither be ye idolaters. Ooh, ooh. That's a hard one. Or is it really that hard? Out of since our study of Genesis the first Corinthians, do we know what idolatry is? It's a statue, it's an image. And yet people will go to their assembly with a statue or an image and say that they are aids to worship and God said it's wrong according to the Bible. And I'm not going to rule out any religion, any religion. Listen, even a Bible Baptist church, people have got their own idols. Whether it be sports, people, actresses, movies, money, whatever it is. If it's ahead of God, it's an idol. Neither be idolaters as were some of them. Again, go back between uh, the Red Sea and the entering the Promised Land about idolatry. As is written, the people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to play. That is written right when Moses made that golden cow. No, Aaron, made the Aaron, yeah. Aaron made the Moses. Aaron made the... Okay, that's the... Once you get stuck, don't. And that was your vacation Bible. Let's break out the programs. Let's break out the singing. Let's break out the food. And let's have a good old time. Because meanwhile, the word of God is up on the mountain with Moses and, and God's. And then when the word came out for time and had the Bible come time, they were all broken up and, you know, time to. So idolaters, what we think of, okay, an image. Yeah, there was a golden calf. But what did they do with that golden calf? They ate, they drank, and they rose up to play. That's idolatry. Our entertainment system of this world today is idolatry. Whether it be theater, sports, or what have you, it's all idolatry. All right, that's we got lust, we got idolaters. Number eight, neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Twenty three thousand people died one day because of fornication. And let me see what the note here is. Numbers twenty five one and nine. God is serious when it comes to sin. Man is not as serious when it comes to sin. I'm a sinner. Even today, I, I sat here today, uh, gross to contest sin. And I plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and sought the word of God. You know, I'm saved. I should have never done that. I put it under the blood and still I'm guilty because I should have never done that. Though I did. And I just seek out the God and say, I'm sorry, Lord. That's what we ought to do. Neither. Oh, another one. So we've got lust, idolatry, fornication. Neither let us tempt Christ. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where was Jesus Christ in from Exodus to the promised land. According to Paul. When they offended God. They offended Christ. There he is right there. Capital C. Jesus Christ. He also appeared to him as the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. So 
when we read the Old Testament and it says the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, was well displeased with them. And we open up our Bibles, 1 Corinthians 10, 9, we read they tempted Christ, capital C-H-R-I-S-T. That same capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D is the same capital C-H-I-S-T. So the, the Jehovah Witnesses are wrong. Jesus Christ was being tempted by those Israelites before he was born because he was Christ even long before he was born, even before the fashion of this earth was ever designed. He was there in the mouth of God when God said, let there be, John chapter 1, verse 1. The Messiah was with them as they went on their journeys. He was that rock, Paul told us. He said, I'm the water of life. He was that manna. He said, I'm the bread of life. Don't you see when we read the Gospel of John, those Jews should have known exactly who Jesus was. He said everything that followed them in their wilderness. The rock, the water, the manna, the bread. As some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Let's look at them. That's Numbers 21.6. And we're not going to go back in that great detail story, but you go back in, in the book of Numbers where I've told you. And when you read those stories, you'll say, well, how did they tempt Christ? Go back to Numbers 21, verse 6. How did they commit fornication? Go back to Numbers 25, 1 and 9. Study it. Learn it. You, you are the study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman in need, needs not to be a shame but rightly divine word it's not for me to do all your work i read a book the other day i, I finished the book and, and the writer said you know it's, it was about the mark of the beast and he says i've given you all these scriptures i bet none of you went back and looked them up and i'm gonna say i'm guilty too i did it but i'm reading you off the scriptures and listen if you're involved in that sin, I don't know if you are. God's gonna, God's gonna say the judgment seat of Christ, friend, Christian, brethren. That brother that you heard that message, he gave you the reference. Why didn't you go back and read it? When you got a Bible, it has already the scripture references. You're without excuse. I know some of these references are, are foul. They're messed up. They're, they're perverted. They're, but some of them are, you know, they're righteous and right. So if you want to know what the temptation is, if you want to know what the fornication is, I gave you the, the chapter and the verse in the book of Numbers to find out how they did it. But the thing is, study their life. What we learned from 1 Corinthians 10, God was not happy with them. Out of the main group of them that were in the wilderness... Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that got into the land. So how to make God please? Watch Joshua and Caleb. How not to get in the promised land? Watch your anger with Moses. How not to get in the promised land? Watch what Aaron wasn't supposed to do. How not to get in the promised land? Watch how Miriam's conduct was. And then look at the Israel. When the ground opened up and they were swallowed. And then they, they had to look and live upon that brazen. Look at those things. Those made God angry. And Paul writes them to the Corinthians in chapter 10. That those are our examples. That anger. Yeah, we're under grace. It still angers God. We may not go to hell, but we can lose rewards. You know, go through, oh, I don't know what lust is. I don't know what fornication is. I don't know what idolatry is. You got the cross-references. Go look them up. Go study them out. Now watch this. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples. Well, he just said over here earlier, he said, um, where was it? Examples. Oh, where I thought you said our examples. 
verse 6. Now these things were our examples. Now there are in samples. That they are written. The book of Numbers, so far what we quote for, is written for our admonition that we are to know what's right and wrong. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. It tells us how not to shame ourselves. The conduct of those Jews in the wrongness, we don't do. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. That's pride. Oh, look how good I am. You, <laughs> you're going to fall. Pride and being proud leads to a fall. And it's funny how that verse 12 is just stuck in there. Was that one of the reasons why they did what they did? Because they're, you know, look who we are. We deserve food. We deserve drink. You, know, you deserve hell. Wasn't it enough that God took them out of that bondage? Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Beware. There has no temptation, choice, that taketh you, that are saved, but such as common to man. All the temptations ever has happened to one man or the other. You cannot say in the situation you are in, no one's ever been like this. You can't say that. And there's probably someone who's a lot worse off than you. So get that pride off. Oh, I'm the only one suffering here. I'm the only one with the problem. Woe is me. Nobody knows the cares I have. No, there are a lot more who have the same thing as you. And many of them are going to die and going off to hell if you're saved. That's even worse. What could be worse having temptations, trials, and tribulations than dying and going off to the lake of fire for all eternity? But you, you're saved. You go through trials and tribulations and problems. You absent from the body present with the Lord. Well, amen. Glory to God. But God is faithful. Did you get that? We need water. We need food. We need water. We need food. They didn't believe God was faithful. That was their problem. All those plagues that God brought upon Egypt. All the victory he got upon Egypt. Getting them out. Listen, can you imagine? Open, here's this big sea. It just opens up for you. You walk across. And your enemies are drowned. You come to the first place. All right, you got water. Lord, you know. He provides water. You come to the next place. You ain't got no food. He provides food. And that was the way through the whole trip all the way into the promised land. You ought to take your life and the problems and the situations happen. They were, well, this may not be the same problem I had before, but God is able and faithful to get me through this one. He got me through the last one. And brethren, I fail at that one. When I get in the present situation, I don't want to look back and say, God, Lord, right now. And I'm telling God, you're not faithful enough to take care of me now. Though you've taken care of me through my whole life. You know? That child, you know, you're in a store one time, and the, and the child gets misplaced and goes up and gets scared. He's lost his mom, he lost his dad. And they're looking around. And then, you know, you find each other. Well, is that child supposed to, for the rest of his life, fear that mom and dad's going to leave him? No. 
It would bring you to, hey, they went looking for me. They'd love me. So next time I get lost, they're going to come looking. Don't need to panic that much. They're looking for me too as I'm looking for them. But when we look at our life problem with God, we don't do that. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. That's a remarkable verse. And how many times have we said, oh, can't deal with it. This is too much. And then you're calling God a liar. And I had to do it with my, with my wife who died with cancer and all that. She'd get to the point, this was her life verse. She said, this, this chemotherapy is just too much. I, I can't take it. I said, but what's your life verse say? God knows you can take it. There's a reason why you can do it. And we've got, we lose track of God and his ability. The one that made a pretty rose. The one that feeds the animals. The one that takes care of all the planets. The one that provides a, a, a child a life in the womb to be born. The one that will provide a saved Christian a life to be present with the Lord after he dies. The one that's answering prayers on a on a multitask system. You realize how many people are praying to God at one moment? And yet we cannot trust him in our life. That, that's a sin. It's too hard. It's too much. And I've been there. I, I'm not talking about other people. I'm talking about me. And we're just telling God, we need to confess. You're not faithful. And he is. Because you stay here. Let me go over here. Let me read you something. It's quite interesting. I'm going to go to 1 John 1, 9. Now watch this. Watch how much a liar we make God. Me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And here it says... God is faithful. The same God is faithful with washing our sins away. Is the same God that can take care of us. I don't think Joshua and Caleb had any trouble, did you? Did you ever read about them having trouble? Caleb's 80 years old, 85, 90 years old. He marches right up to, to, to uh, Joshua and says, Hey, God told me I'm going to get that land. And by John, I'm going to take this cane and I'm going to beat their butts and I'm going to get it. Why? Because God said I can have it. That's faith. He wasn't relying on it. Don't you think he was relying on the strength? Because I added a cane myself. But he said, God said I can get that mountain. And I'm going to get that mountain because I Seek God as faithful. Who did not seek God faithful? All the dead bodies they've been burying from Egypt to the promised land. Aaron had to have a little bit of unfaith there. Why would he make that? Well, I threw the goat in and out came this, this calf. No, the Bible said you fashioned it. You made an Egyptian God for the people. You must have too had the back of your head that maybe God wouldn't bring Moses back down. Why would you have done that? Rest assured, not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. You know one thing when you read that verse? You better thank God that God's not a man. Have you read Fox's Book of Morris what the Catholic priests have done to people? They put you on faggots. Now listen to me. A faggot is a pole where they would tie you to and burn you to death. Third degree burns all over throughout your body before you die. That's not God doing it. It's God that gives the grace of that Christian to die before the extreme pain. You read and do a search on torture. All the ways men have been tortured through history. You want a man God? 
All man has done is thought in his mind how I can hurt someone and hurt them to the, to the greatest point that I can hurt them to get what I want. And God's like, hey, I ain't going to do that to you. And a lot of times when this temptation comes and, and the problems, because he loves us because we've done something wrong, it's to spank on the hiney, hey, you need to get right, or I'm trying to get your attention here. But will with the temptation. So see, the temptation's still there. Also make to escape. A way to escape. A way to escape. Wait a minute, hold on, my eyes are... My eyes are goopy. Okay, a way to escape. Man won't do that to you. If somebody comes up to you with a gun and they're going to kill you for your money, the main point in the thing, they don't care. They're going to kill you. Proverbs chapter 1. Let us go kill this guy and we'll take all his good. They're going to kill him. They're not going to give you a way to escape. But God will provide you a way that ye may be able to bear it. Escape, a flee. Well, what if it, what if, you know, the way, what if, it, what if the person died? Absent from the body, present with the Lord, no more temptation, no more problems. God, Jesus Christ said, when I ascend to the Father, I will send you a comforter. Read the fruits of those comforts. Even in persecution, you can have peace. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Now, I'm going back to the idolatry. That's a little verily, verily. You know what was going on in Corinth? Idolatry. Remember the previous chapter? Well, we've taken this, this meatloaf and we've dedicated it to God X. Well, here's a God X. It's idolatry. Flee it. Get away from it. Abandon it. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. Wise men and the Lord are going to know we're right. According to Proverbs. Every wise man in Proverbs knows what God wants. And knows what God needs. A worldly carnal Christian in the corner church is going to take that verse. Oh well, it doesn't mean anything. No effect on me. I can do whatever I want. The cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Communion. Where we take part of what the body of Jesus Christ broken for us beaten brutally treated and the blood that was shed acts 2028 20, god's blood the body and the blood all that was spilled all that was broken because of my sin for we being many are one bread people we're all one big bread and one body for we are all partakers of that one bread. We're one with Christ. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacri sacrifices, partakers of the altar. Now we read about that the other, the other night. When the Levites did their job at the temple, they were paid by the sacrifices that the people brought. That was their payment. When a pastor passes a church and ministers to the people, what they tithe, what they do, goes to him. What shall I, what say I then? That an idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to an idol, idols, is anything. <clears throat> so, We've got the same thing going on now again. We're going back into what we read the other day. Uh, 
The guy lays a piece of hamburger down on your plate at your table, and he tells you, I dedicated that meat, that cow, to God X. What do you do? And what Paul is saying, okay, you got idols, you got idolatry, and you got Jesus Christ. Here is some way to take bread and wine or grape juice. This is for Jesus Christ. I thank God for God giving this to me. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. This hamburger we dedicate to God X and all the mundanimities of him and all that. Harry Krishna and all that other junk. Whatever they say. So you got God X and you got God. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, not Christians, they sacrifice to devils. Oh. Look what Paul's saying. Somebody who is not saved who does not know God, sit down at a dinner table and say grace. They're saying it to devils. When you go to a church dinner that is not a saved church, whatever it is, and they have that blessing in the meal before you, they serve it and all that, you serve yourself, you're sacrificing to devils. And not to God. You got that? Now, I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Uh-oh. So what dinner table are you going to eat at? God showed you the dinner table where they'll bow their head for Jesus Christ and nothing else. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord. And the cup of devils. There's either one or the other. And many Christians are going to fall ashes on this one. This is division. People don't like division. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. I've known people, they go to church Sunday morning, you know, they take part, hear the message, fellowship with the Christians, and all the rest of Sunday afternoon, and they don't return Sunday night, they're with family. Not saved. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Oh, you make God jealous when you do that. Are we stronger than he? I ain't stronger than he is. I am weak. I am his creation. He the creator. All things are lawful for me. I can do whatever I want. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me. But all things edify not. There are things you can do. You know what? They don't have no purpose. No joy to God. And you have the liberty. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. I don't know what that one means. Let every let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. I, I read that verse and read that verse and I don't know. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles. That's you ever see the pictures of the of the fruits and vegetables and the meat hanging from the the Middle East and Indian countries. That's what a shamble is. It's where you get your meat. That eat. Asking no questions for conscience sake. Oh, I see that, that goose hanging there. Yes. That one right there. How much is that goose? Okay. Stop right there. Just ask how much, it, how much is it so you can buy. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If, if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, they're non-believers, they're not Christians, and ye be disposed to go, all right, you go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no questions for conscience sake, 
Right, just shut up and eat. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, anything but Jesus Christ, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for the conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All right, so you go to a picnic. Here's food. They put it on your plate. You say to yourself a prayer to the Lord, and you just eat it. But if the unsaved person says, okay, let's everyone bow our head and say grace, You know it's not to Jesus Christ. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it. Because what you're doing is you're saying, he knows you're a Christian. So you must approve of my gods because you're eating a meal that, <coughs> that I have blessed by my gods and not yours. They know. For the earth is the Lord's. That's his for and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thy own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judge of another man's conscience? Hey, you can do it. You can eat it. You can do whatever you want. You've got the liberty. But if you go and do something under a devilish name, a devilish idea, a devilish system, you are making them call the question like, hey, it may be okay. After all, we know he's a Christian and he's doing it our way, so God must approve of it. And what's called is you got to stand up and say, hey, God does not approve of that. And you got to tell them because they don't know. They don't know the Bible. They don't know God. And they'll probably get offended. And why people don't stick up. For by grace be ye a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for, for that for which I give thanks? Try it again. For if I be if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I for which I give thanks? Wherefore, therefore, ye eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything in your life, do it for God. But where it crosses that line, going against the devil and devils, that's God's line. I'm not going to eat that because you offered that to your God. In Corinth, like I said, it was offered to the gods of the city. You would, as a, uh, as a Corinthian, they would say, I'm not going to eat that. Well, why not? Because that's offered to the deity. I am not a Corinthian anymore. I am a Christian. And God does not want me to have anything to do with that God there. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, unsaved, nor to the church of God. Look at the three classes there. You've got to be proper to the Jews, to the Gentiles, or to the same people. You've got to live your life correctly. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. Paul said, everything I do is for the benefit that they may know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And if I'm hanging out with a, devil, with a table of devils, and people know I'm hanging out with a table of devils, that's not a good testimony. You ain't going to get anywhere. I mean, you gotta be careful. If, if you got your car with bumper stickers, you gotta be careful where you park that car. You park it in the wrong parking lot, people drive. Oh, look at that! Well, look where he's going. Well, I wasn't there. I was in the store next door. Yeah, but the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil.
Because what you can do wrong can be one time you're dealing with somebody's soul. <coughs> and they're going to say, hey, I saw you there. I saw you do that. We've got to live our lives for God. And as a testimony to others. And as we spoke about in the previous chapter. There are weak Christians out there watching us. They're watching us on how to grow. And they see you doing something that you shouldn't be doing. They're going to say, hey, I can do that perfectly well. He done it. And that's a poor example. And every parent knows that when they raise children, those children are going to take the bad habits of them parents with them in adulthood more than they're going to take the good habits. And I know that for a fact. You can't tell me no. Because I grew up with a life with, with, with this vicious alcoholism drink and just this two blood curling to even speak about. And I remember telling my mom I would never drink that stuff. And I grew up and drank it. Despite everything. See, we are prone in the flesh to do that which is evil. We are prone to sin. And if we don't keep our eyes on God, we're going to go the root of the flesh. If we don't get that shovel and take this flesh and bury it in the graveyard, this flesh will ruin us. And what Paul is, is writing to these carnal Christians is, watch your flesh. Keep it under control. And there are things you're to do, and there are things you're not to do. And the Corinth church is messed up. As messed up as it can be. I saw another place, something I was watching today or reading about a Corinth church. I was like, come on. You're going to name a church a church. Pick a better name in church. 